Yo guys, what is going on? It's your boy Miguel here, and today we're gonna to react to Geography Now India. So, I live in the Philippines, and I don't think India is that far actually. I think it's like a couple hours away. So, we're basically brothers. Anyways, very excited for this video because I actually don't know much about India, even though they're, they're in Asia, they're near my country. Um, I don't know much about India. The only thing I know in India is that you guys have a lot of people, like 1.3 billion people, um, very diverse in terms of religion. And um, what else do I know about? And you guys have a very strong military, like really strong military, one of the best in the world. So yeah, that's all I know. I know I'm gonna learn a lot in this video. So, and wait, I forgot about another thing. You guys have really complicated borders. You guys have a lot of borders with other countries and it's very complicated. That's another thing I know about India. But anyways, let's get right into this video. Very excited to learn more about India. So, Let's go. we have finally encroached upon the giant India. Some of you have been waiting a long time for this episode. I'm just going to say straight up. You all know India is incredibly complex and diverse. Even Indians have trouble understanding their own country. Obviously, I won't be able to scratch even the surface in this episode, but I'll try my best. A lot of you Indian geography peeps have helped me along the way, so thank you. And without further ado, let's begin. It's time to learn geography now. Hey everybody, I'm your host Barbie. This place doesn't even need much of an introduction. Everybody has heard of India. It's big, it's loud, it's colorful, and most importantly, it has a plethora of confusing territorial anomalies yep. I just can't wait to cover. Here we go. Complicated borders. There's an old saying, India is a place where everyone is in a hurry, but no one is ever on time. First of all, India is located in South Asia, right on the Indian and Arabian Seas and the Bay of Bengal, bordered by six other countries, so close to seven, but that land bridge between Sri Lanka got wiped away like 600 years ago by a cyclone. I actually didn't know they were connected to Sri Lanka at one point. Wow, I didn't know that. That's pretty cool. Divided into 29 states and seven union territories with the capital New Delhi, which acts as its own administrative unit located in the capital territory. Keep in mind, New Delhi is actually just the name of one of the districts in the capital territory made up of 11. The largest city, however, is actually Mumbai with New Delhi, Bangalore or Bengaluru and Hyderabad following after. However, the four busiest airports are Delhi Indira Gandhi International, Mumbai's Chhatrapati Shivaji International, Bengaluru's Kempe Golda International and Chennai International in the south. Ah, uh, you know what? I am smiling. This is my favorite part of any episode we ever make. Territorial anomaly time. India is loaded with strange borders and deliciously complex demarcation lines. First of all, what exactly is a union territory? In the simplest way I can put this, union territories are places that are too distinct to be incorporated into a state, but too small to have their own local governments. The first one, of course, is the Delhi National Capital. So it's kind of like it's kind of like provinces. Here in the Philippines, we got provinces. Um, so I'm pretty sure it's like similar to that, maybe. Could be wrong though. Territory where the capital lies. Chandigarh is a post independent city constructed to replace Lahore as the capital of the Punjab area after it was split up between India and Pakistan. Then you have the island territories, the smallest one, Lakshadweep, and the Andaman and Nicobar Islands. The Andaman Islands being home to one of the last uncontacted people groups on the planet, the Sentinelese tribe, whom have been hostile to visit. Oh, I've actually heard of this. I heard that there was, um, I don't know, he was, um, he was a dude. So it was a foreigner. He was, he traveled to India. I think he bribed some fishermen to um to go to one of these because he wanted to spread Christianity or something. I don't know. He wanted to do something in the island. Um, I didn't think he was gonna do anything harmful though. He just wanted to do like something. I forgot which one it was. I think it was like spreading Christianity or something or religion to them. Um, which was definitely a bad idea. Actually, I didn't. I don't know how he thought that was a good idea, but did not work i think he got killed by um these people so rest in peace to that guy um yeah not safe this country or this place is not safe sitters and are therefore left alone as well as the nicobar islands which actually used to be a short-lived colony of denmark finally the three remaining denmark are former european denmark colony is towns pretty and far though Dadra and nagar haveli daman and diu which are separated by about 200 kilometers across the gulf of kambat and the most confusing union territory the french-speaking Puducherry, which is actually split up between four french district speaking. cities across india karikal mahe yanaon and pondicherry pondicherry is strange because it has 11 enclaves within the tamil nadu state Oh, and in this area, you can also find that experimental hippie-ish commune with a little bit of controversy. Look it up. And don't forget, here, the eastern states, also known as the Seven Sisters, are connected by this incredibly narrow 27-kilometer-wide pathway known as the Siliguri Corridor. This pathway is like a crucial artery that completes the India puzzle. Or so you would think. 
Now let's discuss the juicy stuff. Now in the China episode, I already talked about the disputed areas with India, such as Aksai Chin and Arunachal Pradesh. The latter pretty much just belonging to India as it's almost completely inhabited and operated by Indians. So let's move to the other disputes. Now as of 2015, the Bangladesh episode is already outdated as India and Bangladesh have finally come to an agreement over the frighteningly complex former enclave exclave dispute. In the end, India only lost about 40 square kilometers of land to Bangladesh. But bro, look at this. This is like borders, by the way. I think this is like an India-Bangladesh border. Holy smokes, man. There's so much complicated stuff going on. Yeah, borders. Um, In terms of like territory, borders. Bro, this stuff is so like complicated. Enclaves and exclaves exist. Now let's head north now when you try to draw the shape of india you might want to be careful which depiction you use some might use this picture some might use this some might use this and those that don't really study very well might use this the point is the whole area is like the most heavily militarized diplomatically stressed out region on the planet it's already had like four wars in the past half century basically india pakistan and to some extent china all want the entire area for themselves although it's more of like a pakistan india thing in the china episode we already discussed the chinese disputes with india so i won't cover those in this episode if you want to learn more just watch the china episode but anyway this entire the era was a former domain known as the princely state of Jammu and Kashmir that was under royal Maharaja rulers all the way up until independence. Currently, this place is split up by this fenced off militarized line known as the line of control between India and Pakistan. Oh yeah, I think this is like one of the most dangerous places on earth, by the way. Very like heavily militarized. Heavy Wait, why do we keep exiting? Yeah, this, this place, I think it's very, very militarized. So very dangerous. Like I said, one of the most dangerous places in the world, kind of like similar to the North Korea and South Korea border, very dangerous, very militarized, very scary. Why is this? Well, in the quickest way I can put this, okay, the British are out. We get to take your land. Uh, no, we want to be an independent princely state. Uh, we're supposed to take your land, and the majority of your people are Muslim, just like us, even though your ruler is Hindu as well. Hey, India? Yeah? If you help me, I'll let you secede my territory to your land with autonomy. Deal. <laughs> Your problem now. I love how Mike played India. He totally represents India. Oh, and keep in mind, Pakistan's capital, Islamabad, is less than 80 kilometers away from all that drama. The line of control meanders through the mountains until it stops at a point called NJ9842. This is where things get really crazy. That's a weird there, name, not gonna lie. Chain glacier, the second longest non-polar glacier in the world, and this is pretty much the dead man zone. After point NJ9842, you hit the actual ground position line, a series of military outposts yep. that extend all the way to the Chinese border. That Very means dangerous. everything in this area is ground zero for the Indo-Pak tension. And you know, the crazy thing is, there's actually literally Pretty small scary. towns of normal, regular civilians living in these areas high up in the mountains. Many of which just go about daily life, going to work and raising their families. Otherwise, they have a river dispute with Nepal, wow. and various river islands disputed with Bangladesh. Outside of all the dispute stuff, though, India not only has the world's second largest road network and three of the world's top ten megacities and their own space program, but they also have a copious abundance of landmarks and notable sites. Way too many to list, but some of the ones that you guys, the Indian geography peeps, have told me to mention include places like the abandoned Danush Kodi ghost city, Golconda Fort, the four pillars of Charminar, the Ajanta Buddhist art caves, the Alora Manal. Yo, these are beautiful, Mandal, man. The structures and everything. New fortress, the Golden Temple, which Ooh. feeds over 100,000 people a day. The Golgo Wait, Monolithic up. Ruins, Mandu Fortress, the Golden Temple. Yo, an entire temple made out of gold? Which Jeez. feeds over 100,000 people a day. The Golgumbaz Mausoleum. Feeds the over 100,000 people a day. That's the ruins crazy. Ruins of Pampi. The hill forts Amazing. of Rajasthan. Shaturunjaya Hill. Yo, you guys have a lot of these, like, temples. I don't know what you call it, but these are, like, old school temples. Old structures. They look really nice. Which is basically like a mecca for Jains. The Temple of the Bodhi Tree, Jal Mahal, Bangar Fort, the most haunted place in India, Mahabat Makbara. And keep in mind, just like in China, you can find a great wall of India in Rajsaman. There's also wow, the Anjanea Temple. With I didn't the know that. They had a great wall of India. And at over 150 acres, the Sri Rangan Ataswami Temple, the largest Hindu temple in the world. Oh, yeah, and there's also that building with the stuff in the thing, whatever. Anyway, we could go on for Oh, yeah, Taj Mahal. I knew that one touch ball. He's talking about India's rich constructed domicile, but what it lies on top of is even more fascinating. Damn, you guys have a really nice structures. So you guys have a lot of like old school structures. Kind of reminds me of like Greece. Really nice. Now, don't make this mistake. I'm going to India. All I need are my sandals and sunscreen.
Now, as the seventh largest country in the land area, India has a wide range of landscapes, climates, and elevations that all contrast from one corner to the other. First of all, let's talk about the north. India sits on the Indian tectonic plate that essentially smashed into the Eurasian plate, which in return created the largest mountain range in the world, the Himalayas. Himalayas. It's so strong that it's estimated that the Himalayas grow about 2.4 inches. Mount Everest. Inches or 6.1 centimeters every year. There's also where you can find Kanchenjunga, the tallest mountain in India, or the third in the world, right on the border of Nepal. Keep your eye on these mountains. These are pretty much the source of most of India's major rivers that give life to the whole country. That's why India takes these mountains so seriously. You can also find the largest natural lake, Wular, up in the Jammu Kashmir area. Below the Himalayas, you reach the North Indian River Plain, sometimes referred to as the Indus Ganga. This is the most fertile part of India where the most important rivers like the Ganges and its tributaries flow. Heading a little south, you reach the Satpura and Vindhya ranges that pretty much divide North India from South India. On each side, you get the West and East Ghat Mountains. Which Jesus, is India is massive huge, called man. The Deccan Plateau. Very big country. moderately forest, especially in the east, in the Chotra Nagpur Plateau, where you get a section of the swampy Sundarbans that they share with Bangladesh. Check out the Bangladesh episode. Head a little west and you get the dry Tar Desert along the border with Pakistan, as well as the Ran of Kutch, known as the Salt Desert. And finally, the only active volcanic area would be the Adaman and Nicobar Islands, with Barren Island having actual conical eruptions and Bharatan having tame mud volcanoes. Now here's the thing, although India has a relatively high population density, they do relatively well with maintaining their ecological footing. In fact, in 2016, they beat a world record by planting, disputably, 50 million trees in one day. They've also agreed to re- 50 million trees in one day. Damn. Mr. Beast is quaking about 12% of their country by 2030. The most heavily forested area being the seven sister states in East India. Now, one of the factors that contributes to this would be the fact that India has the lowest meat consumption in the world with the highest population percentage of vegetarians at around 40%. Interesting. Both are lacto vegetarians that consume milk products. By the way, in India, when buying groceries, this label means vegetarian and this one means not vegetarian. Nonetheless, the remainder of the population does typically eat some kind of animal. Oh, I love Indian food, man. Look at that. I already know this is spicy. Bro, I'm actually so hungry. It's like 1 a.m. right now. Oh, man. Indian food are amazing. One of the best in the world. My favorite is Japanese, so I don't think it's going to be Japanese for me. But I'm sorry, as a Filipino myself, I prefer Indian food over Filipino food. I said it. Very controversial opinion. But there's a reason. Most Filipino foods are salty and sour, like sinigang and everything. They're pretty sour. And I have stomach problems, and it's pretty bad for sour. So that's probably why. But I still love Filipino food, though. I just think that India has better food. Animal protein, India food is just nice. Seafood or chicken, but almost never fish or pork, unless if you are part of the Muslim or Christian minorities scattered throughout the West and East areas. Now let's talk about the role of cattle, shall we? India has more cattle and livestock than anywhere else in the world at around 330 million. And it's interesting because since they have prevalent Hindu traditions, the killing of cows is illegal in many of the states except for a few, and each state has varying degrees of punishment for committing intentional cow slaughter. Keyword intentional. Cows accidentally get hit by cars all the time. Once a cow is too old to produce milk, it typically is released into the open to die naturally in the wild ideally nonetheless male cattle get it much worse as they are deemed as kind of useless some places use them as draft animals for labor some religious sects use them as sacrifices but otherwise they are typically sold to the underground market for beef or hides to this day there are about six times as many female cows as male cattle in india so that means yeah something's happening to the males india does have the third highest carbon emission rate after china and the u.s fourth if you consider the eu however emission per capita they rank pretty low at only about two kilotons per person contrast that with Qatar at about 40. There are 94 national parks, 501 animal sanctuaries across the country where you can find some of the national animals like the peacock, the Ganges River dolphin, the king cobra, the Indian elephant, and the highest population of Bengal Tiger. tigers in the world, which are all highly protected. India also has the most irrigated land in the world, which allows them to become the number one producer of multiple products like millet, bananas, lemons, limes, mangoes, ginger, chickpeas, milk, butter, fennel, jute, and about 75% of the a lot of food. alone come from India. Speaking of which, food! Typically you can find the staples oh, roti, chapati, and naan in the north, idli and dosa in the south, and oh everybody eats rice. The more commonly commercialized Indian foods that we in the West grew up knowing, like samosas, tikka masala, tandoori's, and my favorite Indian dish, palak paneer, these usually come from the northern regions of India. Mm, seriously, Indian Bro, like spinach. I, I'm so hungry right now and made it fat. I love you guys. I love Otherwise, the West food. is mostly known for their chutneys and pickled foods, as well as beef, since there's a high number of Muslims and Christians. The South uses a lot more coconut and has some of the best curries, like poriyals, sambal. Curries. 
I love curries. I'm so hungry right now. having the best desserts like peda, mishti doi, rasgula, or shondesh. Speaking of which, India is so diverse and complex that sometimes even Indian people need translators when going to different states. It's about to get 10 times more confusing in about 3, 2, 1. I'm ready. Shashi Turur once said, in India, we celebrate the commonality of major differences. We are a land of belonging rather than blood. First of all, India has a population of about 1.3 billion people and is the second... 1.3 billion. You guys are huge. A lot of people. That is 13 times or 12 times. 13 times more than my country, which is insane. It's, I think China is like 1.5 or 6 actually most populous country a lot of people China with about 18 percent of the world's population about 72 percent of the country is indo-aryan and a quarter are dravidian and the majority of the remainder are mongoloid asian and other people groups they also use the indian rupee as their currency they use the type C, D, and m plug outlets and they drive on the left side of the road by the way technically it's illegal for these banknotes to leave the country but you guys have sent me a lot of them for fan mail for fan friday videos so Wait, no what? Why is it illegal? Again. Now keep in mind, those statistics that I just mentioned are incredibly generalized. Of the Indo-Aryan and Dravidian communities, there are about 2,000 different ethno-linguistic people groups in India. 1,645 district indigenous tribes, 52 major ones. So obviously we can't cover them That's all. That's a lot. We do know is that the North is very different from the South. For one, the North mostly speaks in languages that are all related to the Indo-Aryan branch, with languages like Hindi, Bengali, Punjabi, and Gujarati, whereas the South speaks a completely unintelligible Dravidian branch with languages like Tamil, Telugu, Malay, Ayalam and Kannada. <laughs> Canada. Otherwise, there's also pockets of Sino-Tibetan and Austro-Asiatic languages spoken in the far north and east. Wait, so how do they all, like, communicate with each other? Great question! Although India does not have an official language, there are 22 recognized national languages, and of these, two are the most Hindi. prevalent taught in schools and used by government officials, Hindi and English. And very often, these two are, like, mixed mid-sentence. It's weird. Don't be surprised if you hear someone speaking Hindi and then suddenly finishing off in English. It's like, it's worse. It was like, this? And I was, like, trying to, like, why are you even trying to do that? I know, right? And the washing machine, I told them. And actually, ah, I just bit my uh, tongue. But actually, um, here in the Philippines, very similar. We use Taglish, which is like a combination of Tagalog and English. That's actually how I speak. Um, if I speak, I usually most of the time speak Taglish. I kind of mixed up the two languages, Filipino and English. So, but yeah, very similar. So very, you guys do that in India too. That's pretty cool. A Bob Saget with a chainsaw. Now, of course, let's discuss the one thing that goes. Wait, what did he say? But I said, give a Bob Saget with a chainsaw. Now, of Bob course, Saget let's discuss the one thing that goes hand in hand with India: Hinduism. About eighty percent of India claims to be Hindu, or at least part of the Hindu practicing community. Now, we don't have time to explain everything about the tenets and multi-layered philosophies and practices of Hinduism. If you want to know, just talk to a Hindu person. But basically, one thing you do need to know is that Hindu-driven ideologies pretty much dominate most of life in India, everything from family to business. You will see colorful, mesmerizing shrines, temples statues and rituals being performed everywhere even in public on the Bharat Mata the mother of India statues are everywhere she's like the symbol of India the largest Hindu pilgrimage the Kumela happens every three years rotating between four cities in which the adherents bathe in the Ganges River and enjoy a massive festival with tens of millions of people like seriously you can practically see tens of millions of people that's like a pool party that's that sounds like a lot of fun actually Damn. It happening from space. Now, a controversial topic in relation to Hinduism would be the caste system, which is basically a belief. I've learned this in um, I've learned this somewhere in high school, I think. Belief that people or are born school. into a socioeconomic life that they are destined caste to serve. Caste system. Into. I remember Today, that. The system is more fluid and loose from what it used to be from a long time ago. And thanks to economic reforms, anybody with enough drive can kind of move up the social ladder, regardless of birth. Nonetheless, India is home to every major religion in the world, even a few Jews, including the Benai Menashe, an indigenous group that claimed to be one of the lost tribes of Israel. In fact, Judaism and Christianity actually had a head start in India way before it even kicked off in Europe. As tradition holds, Cochin or Malabar Jews migrated around 1000 BC to during the times of King Solomon, and in 53 AD, Thomas the Apostle of Jesus arrived in what is now the state of Kerala to establish the first church in India. Today, most Christians are found in the southwest and far east Seven Sisters regions. India also holds the highest population of Sikhs, Jains, and Zoroastrians, mostly found in the north, and the second largest Muslim population in the world after Indonesia. Most Muslims are populated around the northwest areas by Pakistan or in the east by Bangladesh. Oh, and don't forget the Buddhists. In fact, Buddhism actually started in India. Today, the Dalai Lama even takes refuge in Tespur in the state of Assam. Oh, that was a lot of information. 
information. Ah! Okay, so by now you can probably get a grasp of how incredibly mixed and diversified India's population is. Way too long to explain, but in the quickest way I can put it, Indus Valley, Maurya and Gupta empires, Southern empires, Golden Age, Middle Kingdoms, a ton of new religions come flocking in, the North fell to the Delhi Sultanate, the South became the Vijaya Nagara Empire, the Mughal Empire starts, British East India Company, direct British rule, nationalist movements, independence, republic, economic liberalization in 1991, and here we are today. <laughs> Vijaya. Essentially, India used to be made up of around 500 smaller royal princely states, and when the British came in, they kind of exploited them to manage such a huge population. Although India is a democratic federal republic and the largest democracy in the world, the old royal families still exist today, and although they have no political power, they hold high positions of influence in their communities across India. So today, technically, you could meet someone that would be considered an Indian prince or princess. Nonetheless, the biggest thing that really united Indians in the past two centuries would probably be their hatred of British rule. It was kind of like, well... This is not cool. Yep. What do you say you and I work together in a... end this thing? Essentially, one good thing you could say that came out of imperialism was that it kind of stopped all the internal squabbling and unified the groups towards one common goal, to get rid of imperialism. Today, Indians are just proud to be Indian. I mean, a Tamil soccer player can get cheered on by a Rajasthani. A Punjabi pop star can sell out tickets in Orissa. Speaking of which, all Indians love movies and music. India has the Bollywood. second largest film industry in terms of volume, pumping out nearly 2,000 films per year. Surprisingly, Nigeria pumps out more. However, the box office revenues gross out at only about $2 billion annually compared to Hollywood at over 10 billion. Oh, and like every movie in India has at least one scene where everybody breaks out in song and there's almost always a happy ending. Unfortunately, mainstream media has also high school musical type stuff. On many of the people I like that. It's almost become an obsession to be light or fair skinned, causing people to go so far as to buy skin bleaching products. Some other controversies include things like illiteracy being an issue in many parts of the country, especially in the rural areas. But I mean, come on, when your country has literally hundreds of different writing systems, go figure. I mean, give them a break. Also, many of you guys, the Indian geography have asked me to bring awareness to the fact that India does unfortunately have some of the highest rates of human in trafficking and child slavery. The government is trying to crack down and culture is slowly being reformed, but for now, it's a sad reality that still does exist. Hey, here at GN, we talk about the good and the bad. I'm just saying. Otherwise, sports do definitely tie everyone together as well, especially cricket, the national sport, even though they also used to do really well in field hockey. India also has a lot of their own indigenous sports like Dobkel in Assam, bull racing in Kerala, in Suknar, rod pushing in Mizoram, and Malakamba, this strange pole yoga gymnastics thing in the south. Otherwise, some notable people from India or of Indian descent might include people like Startha Gautama, or the Buddha, Mahavir, Ashoka the Great, Prithviraj Chauhan, Aurangzeb, Shivaji of the Maratha Empire, Mohandas or Mahatma Gandhi, Indira Gandhi, Subhash Chandra Bose, Jawahar Lal Nehru, Rabindranath Tagore, C.V. Raman, Satyendra Nath Bose, Bhagat Singh, Dr. A.P.J. Abdul Kalam, Shah Rukh Khan, Amitabh Bachchan, Amir Khan, Salman Khan, Priyana Chopra, Wait, ben I actually think I recognize someone, surprisingly. Shah Rukh Khan, Amitabh Bachchan, Amir Khan, this guy, this guy's familiar. I've probably seen him on a movie. I may have watched a Indian movie that he was probably one of the main characters. What movie was that? I watched it on Netflix, man. I swear it was recent. It was this year. I saw this guy's face. I found it. Guys, I found it. I found it. It's this movie, The Three Idiots. This was a really good movie, actually. I recommend you guys watching this. Wow, okay, so that's, I didn't know that mu that movie was Indian, so, um, that's, a, that movie was, a, that movie was really nice. I suggest you guys actually, um, watching that. So, okay, so that's him, finally. Ooh. Salman Khan, Priyana Chopra, Ben Kingsley, Sundar Pichai, Satya Narayana Nadella, A.R. Rahman, Sachin Tendulkar, and Mahendra Singh Dhoni. There's also literally millions of other famous people I missed out on. If you want to mention them, please, there's a comment section below. Use it. In the meantime, we got to finish this info marathon, shall we? <laughs> Now, no surprise, India is huge and therefore has a huge international outreach when it comes to diplomacy to almost everyone, except their immediate neighbors. First of all, countries with large population percentages of Hindus and Indians like Fiji, Guyana, Suriname, Trinidad and Tobago, Mauritius and Malaysia typically stay close to India's roster of go-to friends. They enjoy cordial relations with trade. Now, the UK may have left on a sour note, but they still have a lot of ties to their former colonizer in terms of business and tourism. India is still part of the Commonwealth, not Commonwealth realm, there's a difference, and the UK has over 1.5 million citizens of Indian descent. As mentioned in the China episode, China is kind of like India's I'm only here to do business with you and nothing else friend. 
end, as drama still hasn't subsided in regards to the territory conflicts. Now, when it comes to the U.S., things started kind of sour back in the 70s during the Indo-Pak War of 1971, when the U.S. sided with Pakistan, their arch nemesis. Today, relations have cooled off. Mostly, the U.S. supports India's move towards democracy and is a key ally in the military conflicts in the Middle East. When it comes to their best friends, however, most of the Indians I talked to have said Russia and Bhutan. Russia, because during the Indo-Pak Wars, Russia came in and supported them, and ever since then, each country has held a high... Of course, man. U.S. sides with Pakistan and India side I mean Russia sides with um with India. That's just how it is. Um yeah, this is Cold War times too. Yeah, usually um the Soviet Union and USA were just like basically funding other countries in their wars um and supporting them. So yeah, US sided with Pakistan and India and Russia sided with India position of respect for the other, especially as global superpowers. Bhutan and India signed a treaty of friendship almost immediately after independence. The two countries have shared interests and a currency pegged system as well. Bhutan even supported the annexation of their cousins in the Sikkim state into India as it gave a nice buffer of land from China's stake to their claim. In conclusion, you will not find anywhere else on earth like India. Thousands and millions of people- Very in unique, colorful, very unique green, country. Slightly gritty at times, slab of earth, blessed and cursed in so many ways, yet wonderfully harmonized, mostly in a unity unlike any else in the end that's india ah, that was a good one indonesia is coming up next in the Thank end you. all right that was i learned a lot bro i think my mind kind of exploded there there was a lot of like i don't know territories and stuff very complicated stuff but yeah very unique country india man i love india i want to go to india in the future i will definitely go to india in the future it's very near my country but yeah i want to go to india just to actually just eat their food man man their food is so damn good so good but anyways that's gonna wrap today's video um if you're indian let me know in the comments um love from the philippines i live in the philippines i know i know we're chill right i don't think we're we, we have any like beef or anything i don't think we're fighting i think I'm not sure. I don't really know what's going on in the world right now. So I'm not really checking the news too much. But anyway, but yeah, I, lo I love India, man. But anyways, that's around today's video. That is your geography. Now, India. Thank you guys so much for watching. I can't speak. Thank you guys so much for watching. I'll see you guys next video. Peace out.